From there, I'm taking it on to our, our uh, speaker this evening. Jim Shine has been doing maps since he was a kid. <laughs> you know, we, those of us who get lost in maps uh, can appreciate what he's done and, and how he's made a commercial business out of it. He used to be up on Grant and Green. COVID kind of knocked his socks off, as he knocked all our socks off. He lives in Sonoma County. And so he has an online commercial business, but he's much more than just a commercial seller of maps. He's an expert in all the details about our local maps and maybe a lot further beyond our local maps. Jim, is that correct? <laughs> he's those of us who do this kind of history stuff, he's the go-to guy. He has been for a long time. And it wasn't that he was a commercial person, it was the fact that he was such a knowledgeable person. I mean, it was her. She would give a program, which I have at, at the Kansas Institute, which was just went on. They, they were getting the hook to try to pull you out that night. <laughs> Those of us who drool were drooling all the way through. So it was really nice. So we're really, really fortunate tonight to have Jim Shine, who is uh, a friend of this organization, but really he is the expert on the I'm excited to be here. Genuinely, it's great to see everyone. It's great to see faces. I'm going to take my mask off so I can enunciate well. Um, I thought it would be really fun, uh, and I'm always looking for fun. Whenever I do history stuff, I just get excited, and it's really kind of fun. And I know that sounds simple and a little superficial, but the fact is, is it's that enjoyment that causes me to take the time to go down countless rabbit warrens to find a conclusion or perhaps a comparison. Uh, a dear friend of ours, many of us know that, by the name of Charles Brock, he passed away. Uh, with his death, uh, 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 the need to review a collection that she had, and with it came a great number of letter sheets. Uh, for those of you who don't know what letter sheets are, letter sheets are letters. They are pieces of paper generally uh, 11, 8 by 8 and a half by 11. And at the top or on the entire page will be an image, a lithographic image most commonly. The image is derived from a very simple sketch and level of integrity and detail varies greatly on them. They're made by regional bookshops, very uh, much like the one that I operated for 20 years. I mean, still sell inventory out of Quick Tower for the visitor trade. It's, it's these kind of things that, in fact, that leather sheets are. No rates are you produced very inexpensively and captured and used today from the right back home. It's for so many people to be thinking back home, in fact, is someplace else. It was this opportunity that presented itself that caused me to put things together. I've been working with a number of images from San Francisco that were taken in the 1840s and 1850s, and they're rather bucolic, and they're scenes that I have worked for because I haven't grown up in this neighborhood in an urban area. And knowing the history and where we are half a block from the waterfront. It's always fun to envision this as a small town, not in fact a small town, but a rural community. And what was this as a rural community? And in fact, because of the timelines that, that transpired, we have very little physical evidence uh, of what that time was. Uh, for one thing, the terrain itself was, was sand, um, the, the habitat was transient, and the housing was made of mud, adobe. Uh, all of these factors kind of work against us in regards to what was really San Francisco or your So this has kind of been a goal of mine. Um, one of the places I decided to start with a conversation, uh, we were talking about uh, early roads, we were talking about early infrastructure, we were talking about um, what was here. And starting in about 1798, we get the French interpretation of what is in fact Spanish territory. This map's a little confusing, um, and it's fun for its confusion. It's a monochrome map. This is done by La Cruz. This is the English edition, so I have it as 1798. In fact, it's really published in 1788, and considered proprietary by the French government for the first 10 years, so unfamiliar to the outside world for that duration of time. Um, in fact, a guest tonight brought us a original uh, folio from that 
Atlas post of first uh, one. Uh, and this is, of course, on a hand laid paper. Uh, you see it's a quattro folio, the size of the paper, it's folded in fours, and the marvelous piece. Um, that's what we're looking at here. But in the context of what we have, uh, we actually are sitting about the Fairlawn Islands, and we're looking into the mouth of the bay. And the mouth of the bay at this point here is very narrow point. We have a small legend, which in this context, unfortunately, the PowerPoint is almost a legend. Unfortunately, it's completely illegible. I know the sense. Um, K would be a flat. J would be Alcatraz. Excuse me, Alcatraz. And M would be here for play. What's relevant to this map is the French have just sailed around the world. It's come around about 65, 85, 100 nautical miles per hour. And they really like to run out some water. So things like water are documented. And we have the Guinea Coast of Waters. We have the Minnesota or the Cano Cabina. We have uh, Syria Lake. And the like said, showing that there's an extra connection. Um, these are landmarks that we actually know well. With that in context, we see the Earth Point, this recon point where the Bay Bridge is actually connected to this island, and this being the northern point, which is about Broadway and Sansom or so, a fifth face on uh, Hotel Redfield. Um, so, and then as we kind of line things up, this is actually a fairly straight line here. Um, this is early San Francisco Bay, and this is the French at a time when. This is the political boundaries of the United States. Uh, so this is New Spain coming all the way up. And this is American territory. This is still a part of Spain. This is essentially French and English colonies. Um, so sailors don't know how to swim. And this is what you see every day. You come in to see a Cortez, you see cuttlefish, et cetera, et cetera. I just kind of want to instill how far away we are from everything and how scary it is to get here. Um, here Jumping on a boat and you don't know how to swim nothing around these water, and you're subject to the whims of the person in charge of the boat. And this is what happens when if you're lucky, you get to jump off the front while it's attacking the boat. <laughs> um, additionally, uh, here we have the, uh, the indigenous peoples of the town of San Jose in New California. This is a 1790 German engraving, uh, if taken from fact, published from 1790 to about 1815. And although these are incredibly fed from the people, they are intimidating to say the least. Uh, same with the uh, people, um, native peoples of the Bay Hunters, right? So in the background, we see San Francisco Bay. Um, I like to point out in this piece, it's a second edition, Victorian principles dressed in this man in the second edition. Of <laughs> so in 1844, when this was first published, he was naked. Um, and then, but I do like to point out the background and the shoreline of San Francisco Bay and the severity of the coastline and how relevant it is to have a soft, sandy coast to approach. For the most part, we have hard edges on a deteriorating coast. For this evening's presentation, uh, for the purpose of uh, looking at what was important, we're in colonial Spain. And so the basis of government is when it comes from two places. It's when it comes from the city, it's when it comes from the church. And so as such, we have a uh, Illustration. This is a pre-production map, and I've used it because it illustrates the conversation. So that was done by a man by the name of Kenneth Cathcart, who was a map maker here in San Francisco. He researched our history in the middle of the 20th century. And this map, drawn about 1945, was a view of the studio in 1820. Um, and it's a, a very simple outline, and if you want to click a little more, you'll see that we actually have the boundaries of the studio. And what it explains is that these boundary walls are ruins. We do have some housing inside, which is semi -green. And then we have other housing, which is the offices of the commandants, uh, as well as other individuals. Um, it says it lost its greatest function after 1812, but in 1820, it is still functioning in court. We will make our fort, and we will remain so until 1835, at the very least. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see that at the top, we actually have a statement. Oh, it's really bad. I'm glad I know this. Um, it says Pino de Para la Mission de Dolores. So, this is in fact a road from the Vesuvio to Mission Dolores. And it states that the founding of the Mission Dolores took place uh, in 1776, and it says it's probably in September. Uh, and it mentions here that the Vesuvio was also founded in 1776 in July. Um, this road is relevant um, for those of us who like to walk, it's Lover's Lane. 
Um, so it still runs from the Presidio up into the Presidio gates and up and through. And it's interesting because it, Lover's Lane essentially became the San Suchi Trail. And the San Suchi Trail is one of the three trails that left the Presidio to connect it with the rest of the world. And the San Suchi went down to the mission. It ran through the Bizarro and down to the Hate Fillmore and over at Church and Market and down to the mission. Um, when we go to the uh, north face of the Presidio, it says it has a beautiful view today, and you see Alcatraz Island in the and perhaps a kind of a chaparral kind of drawings here, bills and building drawing, um, with the reference to the road in front. And then here it has two roads mentioned. One is the Camino to the Castillo, to the fort, and the other is the Camino to the Yerba Buena. Okay. So these are the centers of transit and commerce for what is the San Francisco Peninsula, or at this time, the entrance to San Francisco Bay. Um, this is basically what it looked like. Uh, we are facing north now. Um, here's the fort, or here at Fort Point in Castillo, and that here in Point. Um, this is the same location in 1855 uh, from the end of San Francisco. Uh, very similar layout. Uh, this is just uh, very popular image, it's one from a classic book. So many of us have seen this image, but to take it and have it in the context of this map, in the context of the viewpoint, recognizing that our backdrop is the Marine Bedlands and Mount Tan, it starts to take a little bit of um, stock of the landscape and the terrain in which we're in. And we also have some views at this time, these views from about 1845, 46. So the first views that I find in any of my work that uh, show this early community of Yerba Buena and the mission. Um, this is the mission, and essentially 16th Street is coming from our left and coming in dead at the mission. At that time, 16th Street is in the center street. We'll find a couple of images along the way that are, excuse me, very familiar to this. Um, the other location that we're going to is Yerba Buena. And this will be the first view I can find of where we're standing today. Um, town, downtown, the area that we would call San Francisco. Uh, this view is taken from essentially Knobville, and with it, we can see here the island. We see a depiction of Mount Diablo. Uh, we see the top of the cove at about Broadway, and we see the top of the cove being great on the point. I point these locations out because, as a chain of continuity through the whole presentation, we find that these landmarks are seminal and baseline for all work that's done. In fact, by this time, it's early, but it's very apparent the Americans are kind of looking at, at what this bay is and what it has to offer. Um, and this large bay is indeed a great offer. Here's a view of Yerba Buena from the opposite direction from the same year. And it's showing us the town in this big, illustrious mountain that's called Rath Hill, Russian Hill, and Nob Hill. Essentially, not too untrue. And it, uh, one of the things that we consider is right where we are. Another half a block, and we go to a sandy shoreline. That's essentially where we're standing at here. It's the sandy shoreline. This is the plaza. In the middle of the plaza, we have the Customs House. Customs House was built in 1835 by William Richardson of Richardson Bay, we know him. He was a land grant recipient, but prior to that, he was an official customs officer for the Mexicans. And he set up camp here to both live here and to gain excise tax from the exports of goods from the days when this was. Uh, Fort Town trading in tallow and hides. Right? All the landowners had cattle. Everything was made of leather and wood. They all needed to be creased up. So these were actually fairly wealthy communities and that they were you know, sitting here in this bucolic grazing land. Um, so as we go along, here we're already to 1833, and here we see Fort Point and the road from the studio to the castle. I forgot to point out on the Fort studio map, I forgot to mention that's long. This is the Presidio. This is the house of the Briones family. And this is the house of the Admontes. Well, Briones is known to us for Juana Briones, who's mm -hmm. quite famous for her um, proficiency and cattle raising. And the fact that she, in fact, was raised in this house and then got uh, her parents and had the farm here, which we call Washington Square. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the lagoon that we have said that this is the Presidio Road. Then you have a road going down here, which takes us down. And the mission being here next to the Laguna de los Colores. So, as the French documented the mission, as we come down this road, it comes to the El Camino Real and is taking us down to Mexico City via 
Department of Rural Sounds, right? So this would be Casita Creek with the Faro's Van Grant, Noe's Van Grant, Bernal's Van Grant, and some other ones. Carmen Bowman, that's uh, St. Louis Hospital about Valencia. So that's uh, still there. In fact, that land that, that actual lot, if you go there and look at that intersection, the parking lot is still at the same boundaries as it was on the original land that. It's never changed its place. Um, and then you continue down uh, and you wind up at the uh, mission in Monterey. Uh, so this is the Carmel Mission. Uh, Carmel Mission is relevant because it is the spiritual center as well as the geographic center as well as the political center. Monterey is the center of Mexican government. The Carmel Mission is the site which the gentleman who made the first map, La Perouse, when he was here in 1786, this is where he stopped and stayed for two weeks. He'd be provisioned. Um, he was quite uh, celebrated uh, because this is a Catholic mission. And he, being a Frenchman, was a Catholic. And everybody being here being a convert, uh, the documentation showed that they were going to be in for a big treat because La Perouse was a real Catholic. <laughs> so this is part of the undercurrent of the politics of the time and Spain and spreading of Christianity. But this is again from the 1790 German representation, um, and it shows the importance of Monterey and the Spanish colonial roots, for which then we have not even any source of information. Most Spanish information was proprietary. And so things that went back to Sevilla didn't get back to us. We didn't get this. So what we have as a beneficiary is our own documentation and that has been provided in many cases sent to the Americans. In fact, this map is 1847, it's actually 1846, but it's 1847 uh, publication by the federal governments, the uh, presidential declaration in regards to the claiming of California by the Americans from Mexico. And with it, we have a series of maps, and with that series of maps was the documentation of where it went and what transpired. Essentially, we start out at Sutter's Fort. And we go to Sonoma and we come to the Wayne and we go to Monterey and come down the coast and we send troops all along the way and we raise the American flag at every location and we do so and we take down the bear flag and we raise the American flag and this is the process. But it is a part and parcel to have such a map that shows the civic Sierras in generality and is really showing us the mission trail and the need to in order to claim California. So this happens to be the number of men, and in total, we did so with 755 men being moved around to support the movement of the needs of the state. It's a very small army to claim the entire state. And, but it's just an interesting note that came in when I'm wrapping in Monterey and its importance. And this is the first place, Portsmouth Square, right here. Yes. I, I see the, uh, the Mormon, Mormon battalion is mentioned. Uh -huh. um, my great 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 grandfather, uh, Robert Harris uh, Jr., and his brother in law, uh, uh, Robert uh, Browlett. Uh, Daniel in, Browlett. They were, they were in the Mormon battalion. battalion. Excellent. We need to talk about that. And, and they were employees, employees of uh, John Vesta Sutter, too. Right. Right. So this was Mormon Bar, and a lot of the control of the area out there uh, depended on support, particularly Sutter. Uh, and uh, Vallejo uh, and the others who were the prominent landholders of Northern California. Um, that gets us into 1847. So I'm going to take a quick break so we can just kind of look at this image. Um, a couple of you may have seen it before. The others, I can honestly say, I've never seen this image before. This was from uh, a great friend of mine. This was on his walls. He and I did warehouse work. He was in his 50s back in the 1960s. Um, he pulled us out of the dumpster out in Hardwell. We asked the family, look, this is, you know, and I said, no, it's okay, Charlie, you can have that. And it hung on his walls so telegraph hill for 75 years and 70 years of that. Uh, he and I discussed it, and, and I immediately recognized where it was, although it was a place. I had never been, and it was simply because I'd maybe seen one photograph at a similar time. So I, I, I won't play mystery games. I'll uh, let us know that we're standing in a cross between Van Ness and Broadway, Van Ness and Vallejo, and we're looking out to the Golden Gate, and we see the hills of Marin, um, and in the foreground, we see a lot of information that's really 
what I'm trying to show and kind of share tonight. Get a sense of what things felt like. It's very difficult in a place that has had its landscape changed so much. And, and this is a world you call it set up. We're looking at a home, John Evans' home, uh, on the Blue Survey. And this is a survey which is running in an angle towards the Golden Gate. And over here, we have what's known as the Presidio Road, which we had mentioned is the road coming from the Presidio to Uruguay. And it's going to come through here, past us here, and find us and out on Pacific Avenue. And here is what will become eventually Van Ness Avenue. It's a little off skew, and it's, its line isn't quite right, but that's about where we are. But what's most interesting and telling about this is some of the old names that we used to apply to this sort of waterfront for uh, Americanization. And the Spanish thing on that French map that we had initially, this is although we couldn't see it, this is referred to as Cape Blanco. That makes sense. It may actually be Cape Blanco in Lebanon. It is, in fact, a giant sand dune, and it is Fort Point. It's Fort Mason. Um, Point San Jose, Black Point. It has a lot of names. Now, Black Point is the name we assign to it because this, in the foreground before it, is a road running the entire length of Lombard Street and just about on Lombard Street to give it a perspective of where it is and where it is running. And it is a massive sand dune covered with black wood. And this is a black point, a very recognizable and very visible. And so perhaps now for the next 35 and 40 years, that will reference these names, but they won't make any sense to us because we're going to change this environment so much in the next decade or so that these sand dunes and willows and trees and things won't exist any longer. Did a lot of money and restoration to create a new prison field. This is the old individual prison field, which they're trying to emulate. And this watershed right here, and all of this is that. But this, of course, being the fourth point in the Presidio Road, taking this prison over to the Presidio Road. Um, this is an image that puts a kind of sense of flavor and texture to what this is. This is a map of the exact same time. Tell us anything about the city of San Francisco. It's a very technical map that, that tells us more about the people who make maps and are in control of San Francisco than it says about our terrain, topography, or our concept. And I find it interesting because this is, in fact, what I was raised and studied. And so to, to find things that personalize something so dry, because in explanation here, what we have is a, a William Eddy's official map of the city of San Francisco created by Jasper O'Farrell through four surveys. Those four surveys would be the, the Boone survey over here. It's a regular 2,600 bar box. The 100 bar survey, the 50 bar survey, and the water box survey. This is the first city plan that it tends to, in fact, fill in its bay and create flat land in the shallow bay as part of the city plan. Also on this map, we can barely see this and this kind of line up there are also the same size. And then there's some color in here. It marks some pre existing land grants that predated the incorporation of the city of San Francisco, including Juan of Briones' estate right here at Washington Square. So there are a lot of interesting factors on this. If anybody doesn't know what a it's an excellent case, it's 33 inches. And as such, 50 bar is 137 and a half feet, and 100 bar is twice about two inches. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, the South of Market was created with an industrial content in mind uh, to a new scale. This is the human scale urban city with a new downtown being built on community flat land, but it makes no content in regards to the severity of the hills that are, in fact, preventing this part of town from going to this part of town. So, in the uh, Context of continuing that conversation. Here we see the Presidio Road coming across, and here we see our review survey. Here we see a training in the center. This is bad. It's a good way to get a sense of where things were. Uh, I recently did a work on a house at 1626 Vallejo, and it's a home that was built by Cunin, uh, who started the first Italian restaurants here in town. And in 1890, he went to the And they built it right here. Which was essentially the lay of So we kind of had our methods and what's going on. This is a very non survey that caused San Francisco a ton of problems, and it can have a talk on its own. 
Um, I don't necessarily want to focus on it, but I use it as a reference because it is a critical thing for determining the area which is originally known as Spring Valley. So everybody wondered where Spring Valley was. This is where Spring Valley was. And this was a valley that is found was between two high points and had the city of Rhode Island. First baptized was right here, we right John Evans, and the first water pipe ran along this way to facilitate that water. So um, we have in this context the uh, building count of the green survey in our painting, the standing approximately right here, looking this direction on towards the golden gate. You see the separation from San Francisco is a 280 foot mountain, and that's all the Russian Hill. And as such, there's a singular path through here. And it took this path from the toll road, from the Pacific Avenue toll road. This side of town is kind of out there in the sticks, and it's pretty rural. That isn't to say that the other side of town isn't the same. So this is the first map of San Francisco that I found in manuscript condition, it's in uh, digital files of real men in the New York Public Library. And I recommend anybody to go and kind of find it there um, because it's done an incredible scan. And in that context, you can read the vessels that are out here and the information applied. Um, I know that this is the customs house in the middle of the plaza. Here's our plaza again. Here's um, your Buena Cove. With Broadway, and then at this end would be Green Top Point. This little line here is the first piece of infrastructure, infrastructure improvement in San Francisco. So it's a bar bed, um, basically, and, and it's a good bar bed because uh, the plaque, which denotes it and, and, and celebrates it, is no longer there and has not been in my entire lifetime. This is a photograph of the plaque from the Penn Park Collection. This is probably about 1938 or so. It was dedicated in 1936. And what it is is that the Alcade of San Francisco, then Uruguay, in 1844, in a great benevolence, created this uh, created this um, bridge going across what was, in fact, an aquifer. This is Jackson Street, and had a creek coming down the past of Sacramento. And Jackson Street had a little aquifer. In fact, if you look at the painting, and we go out this evening on our way out, you'll see a beautiful depiction of what we're looking at here. But this little bridge here was celebrated as the first bridge in San Francisco. And so that plaque was there on the corner, and that would be at the corner of Jackson and Montgomery. So anyway, it's a, it's a, a marvelous plaque, and its dedication is to Hinkle, uh, who was the alcade at the time, and didn't have it to connect what was the Embarcadero at Clark's Point, the only port in town, the only pier to the rest of the community. So it's kind of referenced here, and this being Clark's point, um, Kevin Hames Wharf, we go next to it. These are our first two wharfs. All maritime activity for Mariano and Vallejo, for all of the land grant recipients, all the cattle barons, all of the Peraltas, anything that came and went into the fort, into these ports, went out from these ports here. Um, this is the small community of Europe going in. It's a nice building town. With a piece in furs and its notations, and the fact there are only a couple of things out here. And we're in sand dunes already by the time you get into the Union Square and off into the Mission and South of Market. Remember, in South of Market is a peat bog. And we'll look at that in maps next time. It's really in the 1850s that we start taking on the peat bog of South of Market. Um, but in the interim, uh, the town is here and uh, it's centered off of Portsmouth Square. And I've looked at images of Portsmouth Square my whole life. And they never made much sense to me. Like I couldn't figure out which way was east and which way was west, what I was really looking at. This is a marvelous piece because it's done by Saronian Major. It's 1849, and it's a piece that depicts uh, crowds of men in the front, shows the Eldorado. We're on the corner of Washington and Kern here. This is the Eldorado, and this is the park of Washington. And then we the hotel. All these places are referenced now because we're still to the because they essentially are the east side of Portsmouth Square, and that's the side facing us. Can go back and so, um, with that, we have the flagpole. The flagpole is relevant because it's 50 feet tall, so it's visible from every place, and it truly is 50 feet. Whenever we have a depiction of the plaza, 
This hole is huge. That's a very big flag. Um, then as we come up, we're looking at buildings along Washington, and then this is the little building for the customs house right here in the middle of the plaza. It's kind of a skew. In the background, we're starting already to see ships starting to accumulate in what is the harbor. And if we look down the street right here, it's a block away, right? So we are at the waterfront, and the plaza, half a block away, is uphill a bit. Um, the greatest challenge at this time is 1839. And, and this is a hindsight, but in this image, we essentially have the fact that because San Francisco is so low, and this area where we're standing is so affected by tides, and there is no drainage, and during the winter, 49, it was bad enough, they are referencing losing horses in the mud. Here, here we have, here, there's, there's a dog here, there's a couple, this one here is not looking good, he's struggling. Um, this guy's lost a boot. Uh -huh. um, she's one of the only women in town in 1849, and she's got a precarious. This is just uh, a celebration of all that is is failing in infrastructure. There's a hat floating. Yes, yes, yes. Which is an indication. <laughs> that there's actually a reference almost that there might be somebody underneath that. <laughs> uh, this this is the both the humor of the time, but also an acknowledgement of the growth of the city without any infrastructure. We're really a small town with dirt roads and sandy shores. We brought a quarter of a million people through here in the course of the year, and it's a bit of a mess. And so this is really the neighborhood we live in, and this is predating the ideas of ballast and ships, having cobblestones and all the cleanliness and organization. This is a pretty filthy place in, in factuality. But there are efforts being made. Here's a letter sheet from the Frocky Collection, which is a marvelous viewpoint of um, just a block north of where we're standing, uh, Montgomery Street. Um, and these are the businesses who have erected themselves in 1849. They have the names associated with them. And with some generalization, a building is going to be German. Uh, von der Linder is also going to be German. So we have you know, some Englishmen and some Germans here. Um, we have very interesting buildings, all built in a rather humble style without them from a great foundation. You see, they're pretty low in the ground. <clears throat> Opposite side of the street is, in fact, more of the same, uh, where we have a great point of pride. This has uh, been stamped by the PNS by a shipping line. Uh, this is uh, likely given to an arriving individual who came in on that shipping line. And here's something to write home it's new business uh, branding on Montgomery Street. But I like to look at these because how they're built, the scale, I'm a bit of a builder, and I, I like the scale of things. This is bad, you see, this is probably a hotel above individual retail spaces. Um, this is a clubhouse, a large, might be a large dance room, somewhere in there, maybe. Um, this is a real nice feel about how things are built and the scale of San Francisco. It's a three story work. This building is is maxing out at about 40 feet, maybe 45. Um, that still exists here a little bit in downtown, and I like to point it out. I like people to see it as a recognition because it is the scale. This was big. Prior to this, we're doing tents, little shacks with canvas wrapped in. Um, eventually, Montgomery will grow to be this so six stories, 65 feet, stone and brick. But in 1849, this is really still the town in which we live. And it's a marvelous letter sheet. It's an early one of the time. I stopped with it for a moment. It's all in just a word of taking a moment to absorb it. Look at it. Um, this one has a badge about it. Again, amazing that um, But at the bottom, it says here, Bond Road. That's the fact that we're looking at this. This is, in fact, the street that we're standing on right here. Right? So here we are at 68 Commercial. And as it heads that way to the bay, it essentially goes into the bay. And that distance from here to the bay varies over years. And eventually it's all the way out here. But here is, in fact, functioning north. And when we first go this long, Peter would work, Street work, which will join the California and Sacramento Street to come out also out here. And then next to it, we see the store ship Apollo. This is the hotel Apollo. It's the store ship Apollo, which is a good reference. Background of again, Rincon Point and Rincon Hill uh, coming down. This would be south of Mark and the housing there. Uh, looks like a large warehouse here in the center. And as we come up, some other warehouses like this one here, the plaza isn't right here. Um, 
governance in your sometimes too. So we have some acknowledgments of perspective, and we're standing on Telegraph Hill, looking to the south, and like Broadway and Current. Um, and that would be the old Vanessa's and, and uh, famous spot. Um, no one Telegraph Hill in Park could have seen tents. The tents were Telegraph and not Hill. They were very early in the 1840s. This was housing. Uh, we'll go just another year, and the scene's quite a bit more entailed. Now, the quality of the art is also substantially better. It's not nearly as naive a piece, um, but it is a piece that essentially gives us the long life, the Apollo ship, the Incom going to the Incom, going down the Happy Valley. Um, this will be Montgomery, Plaza, will be some of those sites put in here in the there's the flag, the flag will always cover health for the public's time in Baltimore. Um, also, by this time, we're starting to see ships accumulating in pretty good numbers out in the code on both sides of what we call Market Street from the Bidens. Now, in the digital presentation, the clarity of this really is something special. And I have to just take a moment to apologize. It's a little disappointing for me because these. These images have so much detail on them. We're seeing the rigging lines on these ships. Um, we're seeing the people walking on the streets uh, three quarters of the way down the street. Um, the uh, lithography is superlative. They were done by Cook and Cunt. They're produced half a block from here on Commercial Street and the 700 block of Commercial. Um, these are uh, in the moment views. Uh, this one's taken also from Telegraph Hill South. Uh, probably more like me or Montgomery or so. And, uh, and it is uh, just a great rarity because what it provides me is, is a factual representation of the foreground, which is a scrub brush, uh, sand covered rock outcrop. Um, there are no trees, um, there is no landscaping. Um, it's really quite barren and things are quite utilitarian. This is symbolism, but it does also provide green street for the time. If we go one more image. Simply turning around from where we just were and looking north towards Telegraph Hill, this is what we would see in real time. This is one of the few photographs, it's a little later, it's about 1856, but I snuck it in to my 1849-50 timeline because the house was built in 1850. It is the oldest brick building in San Francisco, and it is intact today. So unlike the Belle Isle building, which has been modified to a great degree, this building sits on the corner of Montgomery and Union Street. It's been a, everything from a corner store to the county jail at various times. This is the Sitz home, and it's a, a marvelous structure. If you go by and get a chance to look at it, you'll see that the walls are indeed three feet thick because they're made of brick. Um, and then behind us, we see what would be Jasper Place or, uh, or a couple of months of street. And then uh, this one lets us know the photographs a little later because this would have been the semaphore station. And by 1854, it turns into a telescope because the center floor was replaced by the Marconi Telegraph system, electronic system. But early, up until 56, actually, um, this would have been the center floor. I'm taking a moment to point this out because it really gives us a feel for the street. It gives us a feel for the building, and it gives us something that actually exists today. If you go up there, you can get a sense of place and point tower for what stands right here. Um, if we go to the next image, we'll see that um, this is probably the earliest photograph. This is from Windway Press. And this is an 1847 to 1849 image of the ships in the harbor. And I throw it in here because it's, it's another one that gives us a little sense of texture. And this one is really just a, a waterline piece, but um, it gives us Telegraph Hill. And Telegraph Hill, again, is going to be our reference. This is a letter sheet that somebody bothered to actually write Telegraph Hill. And there's the, the semaphore station we just saw in the house. From so we kind of have a reference where we are. With that, we're looking at Washington Street from Clay, this would be Brennan Place, and this would be Kearney Street. And I point out Kearney Street because here's the Empire, and here's the New York, and blah, blah, blah. Now, this one is kind of difficult to point out, but you do see the Empire with the columns. The columns are always a good reference because when we see them again from another viewpoint, here's another letter sheet from the island. Here's your point of Ireland. Goblin background, Jackson Bay. Seeing a lot of vessels. When you see a street that comes down 
And right about where we're standing is the shoreline. So this is a really nice reference for where we are. We're just a block <coughs> over right here in this image at this time. And this building is not built until 52, so we're just a little bit before, but we will eventually get there. And this will be uh, an exchange. This will be the Empire Hotel. And this will be part of the Union. And I point it out because it is always a reference. And so it doesn't even matter how naive the piece is. Here's another piece that for years I'm like, hmm, what's this? Is it real? I mean, really? I'm supposed to get something from this? But it's actively look closely. Even with this horrible resolution, we have columns here, we have columns here. You actually see that all of this is portion square. All right, so this being the Empire, this being the Union, and then El Dorado, and in better resolution, we see that even with this naive image and just kind of generalization, we have our reference. We have a certain amount of understanding of how people are telling us and what kind of landscape we have naturally occurring, which essentially is to say sand grasses. And then it's relevant because, of course, this is an image that I mean. Of and seen it in books. This is from the Frocky collection. It's a letter sheet. So this would have been printed within days after the fire and right on a mail home first hand experience. But I've always kind of been confused and overwhelmed by the simplicity of, and uh, stagnation of data. That's the only way I can describe it. But having just laid out a little bit, I can see columns. And so I can see that I have. The Eldorado and the Jenny Lynn and the Union and the Empire and Parker House. Let me go down to the corner here. So, this in fact is the east face of Portsmouth Square burning in 1850. And so, we have in fact confirmation that here's the square, here's this east face that I just described. Everything on this side has burned down to the shoreline. This is the second, in fact, of fire. It's 49, I think, is the first one on Christmas. But this one was a big one and an important one because it was set by some uh, vandals, like cinderaries were used, and this was a Sydney Ducks fire. Um, this destroyed $5 million and 400 buildings burnt. So we have to just do the math and process it because a year later, the exact same thing happened on the exact same day. Right, so we, we don't talk about fire as much, except for that we were birthed from the fires, but several of the first fires were deliberately set by Sydney Ducks. And these were convicts who had come here from Australia after being sentenced to life there for any number of crimes. Um, again, a challenge with resolution and an image that goes, well, what am I looking at and where am I looking from? But in fact, with a little bit of reference now, we see the windmill on Telegraph Hill that's in fact on the corner. Union and Montgomery, right across the street from the brick house, I just showed you. And the first image we were looking at is standing right here, looking this way. So we have reference of places we just were a moment ago, visually, which gives us a point that we're on Russian Hill, Nava, looking down at about Sacramento or California Street, in toward Fortune Square. We can also see, perhaps, if you want to speculate, the wings are coming offshore. Mm -hmm. but on the smoke towards us, and towards it, they're out of the way, so close to into it. Um, and then finally, again, the Sydney burn, this was less than a month later. Uh, and this one was kind of the final straw. The last one already was, but this was uh, nail in the coffin. It, it's just a good reference, though, again, because here's the windmill on that mill, the second mill, the telegraph field, there's the you know, observation, here's the First viewpoint, this is telegraph over the Uber in a very similar place that we were in the last one for a fire less than a month later. This is the map of that area. I pointed out because, again, the site of Portsmouth Square burned, Clay Street burned, where City College is today, where we are is burned, all of this. And what burned, in fact, when the shoreline was here, so everything that was new construction, new piers, new buildings, new warehouses. All of this burned in 1851, and it was precipitated in the middle of it. We celebrated the 4th of July. Now, I just stop here for a minute because I just kind of have to go to the heart of the topic. 
Um, this is a city that has burned almost completely in the last 60 days. And on uh, 4th of July, it's pretty important. We go to Portsmouth Square and celebrate the work here. Um, and this is an important event that is documented in this transient letter sheet that says at the bottom, view of the plaza in San Francisco on the 4th of July, uh, 1851. Um, it's a marvelous image because here's the post office and underneath it is Hatfield's music store. And this is the Monument Fire Company um, built up here uh, in their first incarnation, a smaller building, but it survived being on the west face of Portsmouth Square on Glenn Place. It's being placed over right here. Um, it is interesting because additionally, at the same time, became the first lynchings and hangings and executions by the Vigilance Committee in San Francisco due to these fires. So on June 10th, uh, the first one, it took place literally within days before the last fire. And this was on Fortune Square on Bay Street side. And this is documented in the letter sheet. This is what letter sheets to me were most familiar whereas they documented these hangings, the lynch law, these transient events that were Pretty shocking. This was precipitated by the first Vigilance Committee in 1851, um, as was this one. Um, this one took place on a ship, a store ship, um, out of the edge and the end of Market Street Wharf. So we get a view here of the Market Street Wharf and that which is north of Market. We're looking down Market Street at the Hyatt Regency on down to the Crown Zellabot building here. Um, and there's nothing there but water, of course. Um, but we're getting a first-hand depiction of the waterfront and uses of land and building warehouses and uses of the creation of water space here. And uh, I can't read this, and it's a shame. Uh, essentially, this is discussing that the person convicted was a civil death. Um, he was sent to Australia for forgery and escaped here with many of his comrades. And uh, upon the execution of the sentence, um, he I was asked again to have last words, and he said, mm, No, my sentence is just. Uh, so it was an interesting read. Uh, he murdered the sheriff of Weaver County. Um, he robbed the customs house in Monterey. Um, he uh, held up uh, three stages. Um, these are just some and numerous other crimes, um, and was celebrated for his success. <laughs> so, um, uh, ultimately, this is the times, but with that, in that 1851 fire, these ships burned. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. And this is partly what burned. So we kind of take this area here, and you see the ships, and you see this waterfront, and that's Portsmouth Square. And basically, this is what burned in 1851. And this precipitated a big change in being a small town versus being a city. These events were catastrophic and they're monumental in how city founders in their moment had to deal with what was going on. Fireproof obviously would come to mind. Um, and I, I don't mean to state the obvious, but truly everything up to this point is made by regional and local materials. Uh, very little rock, it's lumber, it's canvas, there's great flammability. Um, so I'll hold on to that. So we'll just take a reference here. Uh, because this is a marvelous image from about 1852. And we see the street we're on right here, North Street turning into the Central Wharf. We see Sacramento Street connecting with Market Street North and coming from here. This wharf you see would have intersected with Market Street, as did Sacramento and California Street, usurping those incorporations and making them obsolete by coming out beyond them. Right? So there's great competition in private industry to build these piers to keep our waterfront and generate income from the goods coming in, and then rent space from these commission merchants that have their shops in there. This is a very nice in the moment view, something that's very hard to see otherwise. It's the process of infill and peering and the creation from going from a pier and a water lot into a street and a block. This is a, 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 a very different time for sure. I like this piece because it has Telegraph Hill, and again, we have our semaphore station, we have our moles. So you see one, two, three moles, and you get down and then down the community here. This is continuity of imagery when we're looking at things from many different perspectives, from many different individuals. And I start to give credit and a certain amount of credence to the amount of landscape and terrain that they're putting into these images. Um, the goal of the artist is to show what they're seeing 
with the greatest of integrity. It's also the make of Utah and invited because they're selling the city, um, either to their paper editors or to people writing or whatever. But it's one of the few ways we can see that these are dirt roads still, without the benefit of cobblestone. Um, and these are wooden cures now. In fact, we'll. Uh, <laughs> Um, this is a great map. And it's a map done in 1852 by Brittany Ray. Uh, right here again, just a block up on uh, Commercial Street, uh, one of the most important uh, printers and in the production of in the moment maps. And any map pre 1855 on San Francisco is for the most part made here uh, by us to document our changes. There's some New York stuff and some Philly stuff. We have relationships there, but um, these guys are working a block from us here in downtown creating this map. This map is a fold out map uh, that shows um, a ton of things. But one of the things it shows is, and we'll just use our peripheral vision or blurred vision on this, which just helps us with. We see an infill, we see green con points on the top of Broadway, right about here, we see Telegraph Hill. Um, we see a Market Street, and we see what appears to be a Mission Street, um, and we see dark lines within here that are. The indications of other things. So the explanation tells us that the fact that those dark lines are words in the streets. I love the phrase, it's marvelous. And, and what they really mean is indeed plank streets. And we are planking the roads in order to create stable ground because it's sandy, it's undulating, it's wet, and the shoreline is still unpredictable. And so with that, as well, in 1852, we've had a number of fires that were just devastating. And so with that, starting at the bottom, we see a political division of the wards. We see water reservoirs coming in for the first time. And those are relevant because they still exist today. We call them sisters, 30,000 gallons each. And if you walk up Grant Avenue or Stockton, at every intersection on Grant Avenue, from here all the way up Telegraph Hill, is a, what looks like a manhole cover. But that one that says sister, in fact, is water storage. And it's called the Alternative Water Storage System. And it's part of something that's then built on again after the 1906s. This is ground drinking storage of water and having water available irrespective of any other thing. If you have a pump and you have a cistern, you can do something about it. Additionally, we see things that are at the Harbor's office, the Marine Hospital, the jail, which is at 300 Broadway, just on the street here, the Telegraph and Telegraph Hill. Bottom warehouses are very important, and I mentioned. Warehouses are about booze. Right? Bond, liquor under bond means that it will be pure liquor, the liquor that you're paying for, not watered down, not filled with contaminants, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's big business. And the biggest buildings in town at this time are the liquor bonded warehouses. And they are the they're they're square city blocks. Um, we also have a customs house and a temporary customs house because the customs house burned in one of the last fires. And so in the temporary location, the post office, which is on Portland Square, City Hall on Portland Square. The way we find streets is relevant. Well, also especially there's two mentions of the theaters. Uh, San Francisco, if you're respectable at this time, there's not much to do. Um, it's a great town if you're a gambler, a sinner, da 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 da. But the fact is, if you're a married man, if you're a, 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 somebody who isn't interested in any of those things, um, one of the few things to do is theater. And um, gentlemen like uh, James Booth, Edwin Booth, um, they own the Metropolitan Theater, the American Theater. They live up, up on Telegraph Hill. In fact, they bring their houses in there and here as early as 1840 to 1849. And the theater is here very early on, and this is a few things to do. But because of that, many of the public slights and offenses of the 1856 Vigilance Committee took place on Sunday theaters and things like that. So there's a social proprietor with theaters. Um, the map itself is giving us our first glimpse of a reality of what we were seeing in that last year. It's the creation of these boardwalks and these piers and the infill that's done coming all the way up to this portion square up here. And yet, right to the ends, there's piers going all the way up where we are standing right now, despite being a half a block in from the bay side still had a wooden sidewalk coming right past it all the way up for another block and a half, according to this map. It provided a safe passageway and a level passageway all the way through three blocks down. Um, this is one of the few maps that shows this very short window because this is private enterprise pushing out forward to retain the maritime trade. And it 
process local warehouse. And we see these have been allocated city markets. These have not. That means these have already been sold off as water lots. And essentially, these are private property now owned in and likely under some of the P3 and 6 feet of water next to a pier. Okay. That comes out here. Eventually, Jackson Street, it cannot be specific. Um, here's Clark's Point and Cunningham's Floor. These are our original piers here on the north end. Here we are at Newton Blaine Cove. <laughs> wow. Um, Telegraph Hill is a reference point. This is a great panorama from 1851, and it comes from a uh, Baron collection. That I found prints of it uh, that I then stamped. Um, but what I really enjoy about it is it gives a good reference, and there are two images, there are five or seven images in the total, but the two images that I'm using. And we're looking across what is your point of code from your income point. And we're looking at Telegraph Hill and we're looking at this is Angel Island and this is uh, Telegraph Hill. So as we look across, what we're looking across, we're standing here, and we're looking across these ships to a hill over here. Well, it's really nice. We just have one photo and then we don't want to look at this. This is really a helpful tool. This is the beauty of this particular letter sheet. It is such a snapshot of time. We see Mission Street starting to go down here. We see the creation. Here's this bonded warehouse. I want to mention that I know it's a bonded warehouse in the pool, right? but it is the biggest image in this building, the biggest building in the city. And we're looking at Market Street at about, I think, first of three months. I think three months. And uh, we're looking across all of these vessels. Now, we're south of Market. This is Market Street. And what's north of Market just burned. And so south of Market, we have all of these vessels. But the inland side is a little different. We stand and just look a little left of where we were just looking across the ships, and we're looking across the water. And our shoreline here would be three months to join up and then a long market. It's very hard to get dimension on this, but one of the reasons I brought the image up is because what's in the foreground. And it's, it's so incredibly telling to the creation of land. And, and everybody sees the water. You see that we have big holes sunk into the ground in the middle of nowhere. This is land. Somebody has speculated, and they've gotten a heavy curve in the mark there. And this is land. This is land. Now, this is going to be the shoreline right here. So this is a little irregular here. This is the next street. And this is a ship, which has been floated and landed now on something like this. And it's become a store ship. This is the process. So a lot of these vessels, when we talk about buried ships, a lot of them didn't survive as buried ships. They were utilized as a store ship until they were either dismantled, or destroyed, or burnt in many cases. Um, but this is a marvelous thing to go too, because we, we kind of have completion of the Russian and the right here. And this is being flown this way right here. And we can now mark it. And it's kind of a city growing behind us. But these water lots are amazing. And to have them in the is what they are. Uh, it kind of gives us some sense. Here's uh, Cunningham's Wharf. All right, so this is an early view. It's an illustration done from about 1848, 49, uh, when this was the only pier in town. And the business here then becomes these large buildings will eventually become obsolete. So, what do we do with them? What do they become? Because the street is going to be out of here in three years, and we know that because we kind of own the street. So these are the kind of things that I'm looking at as far as the creation of streets and infilled buildings and what is here. This is a pretty good sized warehouse. And again, this one is a, li a liquor warehouse, a bonded warehouse, with vessels um, anchored at the end. Everything coming off this boat is subject to commission or control by this entity. Um, here is our view back to the first one. And again, pointing out how our streets are starting to form how we're creating filling in your brain code and what our material is being used and how we're doing it. Um, not all of these will be sunken, not all of them burn, but they are a lot of available lumber. And lumber is at a premium by this time. We have harvested the Marin Hills, we have harvested bourbon. Um, these were lands that had redwoods on them, they were unimaginable. Um, there was a navigation between Berkeley that was used until 1854 um, when that whole hillside was cut down, but prior to that, the tree was used for. 200 years as a navigation center. Um, we burned, and when we burned, we had to rebuild. And every time we rebuilt and burned, we had more needs for lumber. 
So in this time, we're kind of making use. Um, and here's one of the few and rare images. This should be standing on Long Wharf, which would be the central wharf, the street we're standing on, looking back at where we are, back to the Portsmouth Square. And this is uh, published by a bookshop on this wharf, probably in this building here, uh, looking back at their waterfront. Uh, both sides is water. And we were standing approximately at uh, commercial and drum, something like that, uh, maybe right around there. Uh, so we have a maritime city, and, uh, and we have a culture that's making use. So here's the Niantic Hotel. Right, so this is uh, 1854 image. Um, it's a little later, but I have to use it because it's it's both anecdotal and true. And what we see is with the creation of the water loss, with the infill, we're drying San Francisco out. We're pulling the waterfront away from where we stand now, and it four blocks out. And in doing so, this is becoming high and dry. And the vessels that we use as landfill now are becoming the foundations for new structures. This is a store ship. And this was the Niantic. And everybody knows the Niantic. Niantic was the first vessel to arrive. I think it was around July of 1849. All the 49er vessels, which seems very late. But if you were already here in 48 and early 49, you did very well. Many of the 49ers they came over them like that earlier. But the first boat to come in was the Niantic. It drew in and it beached itself right where it is and it remained there and became a store ship, then a hotel. And it remained a hotel until 1872 when it burned out. Then they built it again only on top of the hull stair that's still there. So this is the most inland of vessels and defines kind of the edge of the water, if you will. It also is showing us a street that is high and dry, where we're walking, where our horses are safe, where we can have wagons and caballeros and people can walk around safely. It is becoming a little bit more civilized, um, and that's representative. With that comes the expansion into this code, and for the first time, a road. Now, it's hard with this resolution, but as we come across here, these are plank streets. I mean, many of you marks it, mark it, it doesn't have a dog that way. And then it joins Third Street. Well, nowadays, Third Street is over here. And that dog leg doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And that's an adjustment the city made very early on. But I pointed out because this is the toll house for the Mission Plankway. And so coming from this part of town, you paid your toll here. And you took this road, and this is a boardwalk that is a private road and a private enterprise established in 1852. And then it was climbing that to the expansion of the city. It's really a very, very interesting story unto itself. Um, but it's the first one. It was so successful, it went on full speed by 54 and went on grand by 57. I had no idea. Um, studying city, city history for 40 years, I had no idea there were plank roads on Folsom and Brandon as well until the earthquake of 89 when we saw the impact of that earthquake south of the market and we started researching what had been there. Um, this is a marvelous incorporation of what this is. Now, this is the only image that we know of of the plank road. And this is from Rumsey's library. It's actually from Daniel Burnham. Burnham is a well known city planner and architect in Chicago. He did plan for us, but he was also a accomplished artist. And this was a piece derived from the piece he saw. And what we're looking at um, is really kind of telling. And I like to stop and take a moment with it because it's things I can recognize like Twin Peaks. Um, it's things I can recognize like a plank road over sand dunes with an arroyo and a couple of buildings, sagebrush, romanticized imagery of caveats in the foreground. But at the end of the day, we're standing at like eighth mission, looking down south. And it's really a nice piece because the undulating hills, the dunes, the dune field, South Market is flat for us, and it's been flat three generations. We flattened it. It was undulating hollows, big sand dunes. In fact, in third and market, they were 80 feet high, right? So 60, 80, 90 foot sand dunes and clusters. That's why the Mission Plank Road was built, because these dunes actually prevented Third Street from going to connect to the market. They prevented market from continuing west towards Twin Peaks until they dug the sand. And it wasn't until 1857 they dug the sand, one man, one shovel. Um, eventually, we get steam shovels in here, and that changes south of market immensely. But it's taking you down to the mission. Now, here's another fantastic letter sheet of mission, uh, circa 1853. 
late 52. And um, we're looking at the mission itself on Center Street, coming mean, this way is 16th Street. Um, and this would be the edge of John Fremont's land grant to land down this neighborhood, which would become Woodwood Gardens. And this, where we're standing, is about here, would be Guerrero, and this would be Valencia. So Valencia Street, Guerrero, Mission. Um, it's a really nice piece in uh, context. It shows the stage, it shows an elevation. And if we click it to the next piece, we see that the map supporting that, here's the mission, here's Center Street going down to the bay. Here's Fremont's property. You see the water. This is the edge of the water and the wetland right here. The mission is two distances in. This being Valencia, this being Guerrero today. Right? So to try to put it in place, mission Valencia, Guerrero. And we were standing right here in that image. At this mission. Um, by the way, here's a little circle across the street from the mission. I always like to include that because it's only included on the 1853 map of San Francisco. There are a couple of others, but it's the only one, and I always wondered what it was. And only through the work of uh, one of our great predecessors, a man by the name of Ken Packard, again, uh, did, on one of his notes did I find that, in fact, it was the bull ring. Oh, wow. And it is the site of all bull and, and cattle management. And, but at this time, the bull and bear fights in the 1850s are taking place here. Now, there are other sites in which they do take place, but this is the most well known site. Um, so, this is a, an image of such an event, a horrific event, but that's what went on down the mission in the 1850s. The, the mission system is essentially gone, and it's an edge of town. In fact, when you go to uh, the 1850s, it becomes the city of San Francisco. And it's the same. And what it means is that this is San Francisco, and this is and its vicinity. This is the mission down here. And on this map, we're looking at the Mission Plank Road coming down to the mission. We're looking at the Pacific Avenue Trail coming through here. And we're looking at Europe of William Cove from where you come from to Broadway Street. This is the Water Lock Survey. This is the 50 Bar Survey, the 100 Bar Survey, and the Lagoon Survey. Um, this map is the first map of San Francisco by the American federal government. So it's baseline for all commercial maps and all subsequent maps in regards to survey content, placement, and ground zero. So anytime we do anything geo-referencing on data ground zero, anytime we do any kind of geo-referencing from one map to another, that referencing was done originally by those surveyors utilizing this map. Um, an updated version in 1857, 1869, 1959, blah, blah, blah. But this is our starting point. And so it's a really fun starting point because by 1853, of course, this building is on here. Now, it's not the mint yet. It's the Mothman Company uh, um, assaying office, but it, in fact, is, is here. Uh, so this building counts is, I think, somewhere around 450, no, excuse me, 750 plus buildings. Um, each black dot is firm structure. Um, even with this horrible resolution, you can see this big black dot here, bonded warehouse. <laughs> so, uh, bonded warehouse. <laughs> um, and this, uh, this particular bonded warehouse is marked because on every coastal survey from here after until 1909, we still reference that warehouse. It's kind of baseline. Um, but it's inclusion of the plank road going out to any vicinity, it's inclusion of the bull ring. Um, it's really a, a marvelous map to, for us to work with. Here's its title, it gives us a little detail. It gives us the scale of the publication date, of course, the US Coast Survey. Um, Coast Survey was funded in 1844 after earnestly being started in 1906. In 1844, it got its funding in 1848. They sent men out here. Unfortunately, that year, that else happened, and all those surveyors went out to the gold fields and worked for three years. Um, guys like George McMurtry and Alden, all these guys disappeared until about 1850. When they came back and in earnest started the work that they had been hired for by the federal government to do these surveys. Now it's 1853, and we've already gotten past the Brooklyn Ray 1852, so we understand that in fact water suppression is very important. So much so that on the legend of the map, we have a listing of all the systems in place and their locations, the intersectionality of that location um, as of July 1853. Two. We also have public buildings as of February 1853, and included with them, of course, is our bonded warehouse, our customs house, um, our post office and city hall, which and the state marine hospital and the Harlem master office. These are kind of all baselines. We also have the American and the Delphi Theater, as well as 
seven churches. So now we're a city that is a little bit more developed. We've got churches, we've got hospitals, we've got city halls and jails, we've got water suppression. And of course, down here is the title information. This is a maritime city. I, I, I can't throw that in enough, and I haven't. Uh, I've just mentioned the number of ships. Remember, all the people getting off those ships, they're watermen, they're mariners, these are seamen. And ultimately, the people living here and working here are very familiar with seamen and how they think, and they are or were seamen themselves at one time. So it's a maritime city, uh, without a doubt. With that, we're looking now in 1853, Ringtown Point, Broadway. Here is the office of Jackson. And on this crappy resolution, see right there is the original shoreline. So it's four years after the gold rush. And all of this is already landfilled completely with extensive buildings and two lies at 300 California Street. And two years from now, Jackson Street is quite a different scene. Uh, we have created 40 square city, 50, 60, 90 square city blocks of land. We've got an incredible pathway of boardwalks and piers. Um, commerce is going full clip. Now, it's important to recognize this is transpiring from the wealth of coal that has come. And we're just about to hit a wall. When 1854 comes, we get into an economic slump. So in 1852, we're still in a pretty good position. What we see is we're really benefiting from the wealth coming in and the expectation of coal. The coal is going to continue to hold up. Um, this is a view of Portsmouth Square again. Um, we're looking at Washington Street, Bell Union, Louisiana, um, Kearney Street at Washington. Here's the El Dorado and the Kennedy Theater. Um, Telegraph Hill in the background, right? So our references, we see the randomness and the placement houses. These are on the streets, in theory. In order to build by this time, you can start seeing the city saying, well, we need to be on the grid. We need to have a lot. So we don't see the streets yet. There's, there's pathways if you're lucky. And they come from this angle up this way. Nothing comes up the face of Telegraph. This is a 150 foot cliff. Uh, um, this is Harry Meade's house. Harry Meade's was Meade's Wharf. He was a land speculator, well left scoundrel. Um, so, what we're starting to see though in 1852 is reconstruction. Here's the El Dorado and the rebuilt Kennedy the Theater, uh, the Union. Um, such a good building that, in fact, it was bought by the city of San Francisco. This guy, Quaro, did a nice job because go back one and it says Gentleman Theater. And go the next one, it says City, city Hall. Hall. <laughs> All right, because we bought the building. And so our initial City Hall site, which is the present site of the Hilton Hotel, would have been, in fact, originally the Gentleman next to the communion, which would be built up, and then to the Mountain Park and some other places. Um, but this is a famous east side, and this is, you know, the old joke, all San Francisco business took place with bars on either side of City Hall, right? And there were lager beer politicians. There's all kinds of anecdotal stuff in the annals of San Francisco talking about that very thing. In fact, of course, because one of the greatest uh, numerically uh, immigrants at this time, in fact, are Germans. And Germans and the English, Germans drink beer. Germans are hard workers and pretty law abiding, but they drink beer and they drink beer starting at 11 in the morning. And so <laughs> that's you know, very important. Um, as we continue down the East Face, we actually, here's a photograph. This is by an important photographer. And so I'm, I'm cheating a bit too. We'll get a little later, but here we actually can get a sense of the feel of the fireproofness of this new building and, and why the city felt we should buy this building. Um, because it's a building that we can do businesses and it's not going to burn down anymore as many have. And as we come down, we see that the new, this is in fact the Jenny Lynn, and this is the new union has built up to emulate this actually different building, Italian Greek style. But we're showing wealth, we're showing stone, we're showing fireproof, we're showing priority is that. And with that is a, is a real change. I have this in here because we're just continuing down, here's uh, the union, and as we come down, here's the plaza. This guy was a daguerreotypist. And I included this because this is one corner and play. It's just a block from us here. We're right at the edge of downtown. When you look down, there's the waterfront right there. So again, still we're still only a block from the waterfront. 
But one of the main reasons this corn is important is this guy. So we grew up uh, hearing the stories of Grizzly Adams. And we thought, that's, that's this. But Grizzly Adams, in fact, lived and had his menagerie and his bears uh, at that point, at that time. Huh. And so we're looking at a rebuilding San Francisco. It's 1852, 53. Everything's about fireproofing. And then building piers, all this construct. And in the middle of all that urbanization and sophistication, you got this guy. <laughs> and, and in that moment, he has no less than seven bears, three grizzlies, four black. Um, he has ostrich. He has a, a bobcat, a lynx, a, a mountain lion. Um, half of them are free and loose within the building. And he manages them as friends. I think is how it's described. There's a marvelous writing about it that I've been studying that it came up, it was done in 1909, and, it, and it's a rather charming, but it was originally done in 1872 while he was still alive. And the 1909 perspective is a little patronizing, but the 1872 perspective is very much about this guy is amazing. Um, and he's right here in urban San Francisco. So anyway, in the middle of all this reconstruction and development, we have the Montgomery block right across the street from us, the first fireproof building, being built is called Washington Block. This is to combat the fire. This is Alex Folly, the most expensive real estate in San Francisco at the time it was built. It became a bohemian haven in the 1930s and 40s. And something else, in fact, Ken of Capra, the photographer that I referenced so much, had his studio right there. So uh, we also have buildings like here's the Monument Fire Hall, who are on Ben Place. We see our iron fence at the top of Ben Place. We see foliage. Um, we see buildings that are apparently fireproof, which is good for the monumental fire company. Um, yeah. And uh, we have the construction of buildings like this. It's the St. Francis of Assisi. I've been done in 58, 57, but I snuck this in because it's endemic of the, of the desire to create fireproof edifice. Um, this is the rectory. And that actually has to be right here. This is Grant Avenue. Uh, it's a very familiar scene with, with uh, Russian film in the background. But the scale of this coming in, this is the new San Francisco in 1854, 53. And, uh, and it's a big change. Um, additionally, here's St. Mary's, same thing. We never built this spire, um, but this one is done by uh, the Annals of San Francisco, same thing. Phoenix was promoted like this. But in the end, what was actually built is this. And, uh, that's a marvelous image. The spent the final is still there. Right, that's Dr. Sun Yat Sen at the top of St. Mary's Park, paid for by the Chamber of Commerce and six companies. Um, and then, you know, kind of in conclusion, here we are right now. Um, I found this image over there. That's not where I found it. I found this in the Library of Congress. But when I was squirreling around today, I saw they have a copy of it over there. This is us being built. And this is the age of what we're walking into, 1853-54, is the age of where. And local brickyards are starting to pop up. Yep. The need for fireproof has become the greatest priority. And um, we see here, if you look closely, you have to see the coffin and things that are right there in that evidence. Um, so we really see in the moment how things are being built. And with this image, we see the scale of the street and the buildings across the street. Um, this is not too dissimilar from walking through either a Upper Branch Avenue or Hayes Valley. Um, that's the scale of what San Francisco was at that time. This is one of the Over here? That's right. That's right. Very good. That's right. That's, uh, 626 or 624, yeah. And it's sad that only you can see it, because it is a vertical ladder. Yes, there's this one right here that's really intense. In the middle of the oh, yes, yes, right here. Do you see that in the storefronts facing us? Uh huh. Two little white beaver hats. Uh huh. Do you see those? No, I can't, the the resolution is too bad. They're, they're somewhere in the middle of the and they're a little worried. Uh, uh, apparently, I think the world is given to the white May have been in that photo. Now, this, is, this is a marvelous image, and this one that I kind of wanted to end with because it's it's bringing in 
a new age. We're cobbling the streets, we're building with fireproof materials, we're putting on steel shutters, um, we're protecting ourselves against fire, and we're having more, I think, we get. And that kind of brings us to a map that we know. This is a bridge in this Bixby map, and uh, there's one from Kansas to this is one that might be a cow. It's not in the greatest shape, but it was nice to be able to get an image. All these buildings are celebrated for either being new construction after being burned down and being now fireproof. Um, they're celebrating that they're open for business. They're celebrating the connection between Philadelphia and New York and San Francisco. And they're celebrating a maritime city. So this is a marvelous map to end on just in that it shows us going from, you call it Yerba Buena with three roads coming from the Presidio to an urban center where we've usurped and overrun the town of Yerba Buena, uh, we christened in San Francisco. And with it, we are developing like mad and working our way this direction. In the future, I'll elaborate on that direction. The 1850s are really interesting, but I really wanted to kind of present what it might feel like to have been here in a kind of rustic town in San Francisco. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one of the nice things about here is we own the property. There's no school district. I'll say you gotta get out. <laughs> questions. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody has any questions, I um, am sorry for the resolution. We're doing the best, and in the future, um, we'll have a larger screen. And it's hard for me to show up without a physical map. This is the first time that we've spoken without actually having a map. Richard? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's an interesting point. Um, the Martin Street line is determined as being a trajectory from Mount Diablo to Twin Peaks, right? So that's its survey lines. Mount Diablo is the center and the beginning of initiation of all Western surveys. So since 1840s, we've used Mount Diablo, uh, Blue Mountain, which we call and Table Mountain, known as Mount Tam, as a triangulation point, triangulation point for surveys. In the case of Martin Street, um, Jasper Farrell wanted to bisect the water officer. At the same time, he wanted to make use of the two high points that were easily available to him. So, they are, in fact, Mount Diablo and Twin Peaks. So when you look down Market Street or up uh, towards the Castro, you, in fact, do see Twin Peaks there. That, that isn't coincidental. Um, the aspect that's interesting about Market to me in that feather access, um, it's a time when the creation of flat land is the goal. Uh, barrels can't be stored on hills. You need to be on flat land. Flat land is money. The creation of flat land is the goal. At the same time, it's a city full of engineers and miners, <laughs> guys who know how to run steam shovels. And so we do, we manipulate the landscape greatly. But the greatest advent is O'Farrell's decision to create South Market as an industrial center. And he built those blocks on a scale twice the size of the blocks north of Market, with the expectation that we would be doing industries that were not in human scale. Um, everything that I've talked about tonight. In short, an academic would simply say, oh, well, Mr. Cheyenne's obsessed with human scale. And in fact, that's actually very true. Um, it, it's, it's how I've chosen to live my life growing up in San Francisco. I live in Cape Fillmore, living in the North Beach area. There are neighborhoods that were always ground level. There were buildings that were never higher than 60 feet, and they were filled with people you knew. In short, and that was living in San Francisco for our generation. Those are um, things that I found great joy in, and that it still exists. It's one of the things that makes San Francisco approach me. But earliest of San Francisco was on a different human scale. And so human scale I see when I go to uh, towns like Nicasio or Sonoma, or even uh, any mission town, in particular the more rural towns, um, where I see a town plaza and uh, a community with seven to 12 houses around it, because that's what we started out as. 
and, and very quickly we changed it to something else over the course of four years. So I, I think things like Market Street were incredible because we took it to Hamlet and we had these, um, these visionaries, Jasper O'Farrell in particular, who said, one, I'm going to fill in the bay. Like, you know, we just need flat land, it's only six feet deep. I'm going to fill in the bay with a great water lot. And we're going to sell it off. And we're going to have private industry do it. I'm not even, it's not even going to be official. You're going to pay for it. You're, you're going to do it. You're going to line up to do it. And we did. We did. It's exactly what it is. All paid for it. And ultimately, once you got your, your block built in the city, came along, they got rid of the pier, they built an infrastructure, they put in the street, sewers, and that, 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 that. Right? that was the process. But Jasper Farrell had the foresight to see the water lines and the need to get from the waterfront into the Kalia of the, excuse me, of these western suburbs. Remembering that um, the mission was known as Corners Mission, and everything from Pacific Heights down to the Fillmore was known as the Western Edition. These are the first suburbs, right? We're outside of Larkin Street. That means we're end vicinity, right? <laughs> so, I love this generalization. I grew up end vicinity. There you go. Um, fact is, is the ability to generate wealth was predicated on the ability to flatten land and work our way westward. So these plant roads, first it's industry right here, and then it's industry working our way that way. Now Market Street is just about to that, but those sand dunes at Third Street put a, a, a habit on it for almost five years, six years. It wasn't until 1857, 58, the Hayes brothers with the Market Street Railway spent the money to move those dunes and have a train line that went up to Hayes Valley. Hayes Valley was land, the Hayes brothers selling the Van Ness family, and they were selling the office track land. First summer in the middle, Condition. Market Street's first suburb, States Valley, and then we continue down the solution. Oh, um, I just wanted to make a correction. Uh, cool. The navigation tree is in Oakland in Roy's Redwoods Park, which is part of the East Bay Regional Park District. And here's the actual track. Right. It's just stumped. Yeah, the, 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 the tree does not exist. So the tree's it's not even a stump. There's a, there a, a great historian. Stone monument. Who, uh, who mentions uh, the presence of the stumps up there around 1856-57. So they had been gone at that time, and then the stumps by the 1900s. And they, they were a navigation walk to avoid loss and rock. That's right. It was a, a submerged um, so navigation rock hazard. was exactly four feet below water. As as like perfect, and it was, it was meant it was like 300 feet tall, and it stopped right there. And it was just between Alcatraz and the mainland. And it's right on your trajectory. If you follow the line right in, you're going to hit it. And it was a major navigation hazard. And it was a major part of Army Corps of Engineering and the creation of how to do demolition on the water. Um, the use of caissons, as they had learned uh, later at the Brooklyn Bridge, they experimented with here to create a uh, vacuum or a protected space to impact and impound uh, explosives so that they would, in fact, blow this rock up. And they did. They blew it up three times in order to get rid of it. And there is a major rock pile in there, rockfish level. Yeah. But it was a huge deal. The pool of water went 1,200 feet in the air. So, yeah, it's really celebrated. Lots of rock. Shag Rock was another movie that got rid of by Mission Rock. Mission Rock would just fill it all the way up to the shoreline, and now it's super there. It's not a All right. Now, Nelson. 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 Thanks, you guys. Thank you.